you to find a Bible. If you don't have one with you this morning, you can find one in the pew in front of you. And turn to Mark chapter 16, and then also flip to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to be looking at both of these uh, passages this morning as we study. Uh, We've been in this study of the Gospel of Mark since the first Sunday in January. And if you've been here, you know we've been walking through the story of Jesus. And if you remember, all the way back at the very beginning of Mark's story, we find Jesus in the wilderness. And we talked about that the first week. The fact that Jesus is in the wilderness, uh, there's a sense there in which the wilderness represents the fallen world. This world of sin. This world in which Adam and Eve sinned and set everything in motion in the wrong sort of way. And here is Jesus, as Mark tells us in the very first verse, the Messiah, the Son of God, who has stepped into our world, into this wilderness. And he's come to transform the wilderness, to take the fallen world and to make it right again. And so that's what the story has been since the very beginning. I've been working through this story. We've been watching as he's walking around with his disciples, as he's doing all the things that he's doing, as he's saying all the things that he's saying. And last week, we came to Mark chapter 15. I'd like to thank Neil Kring for being here and, and doing a wonderful job opening up this scripture for us. And we found that this Jesus, who stepped into a fallen world, was crucified. And all of his disciples and all of his followers were shocked. They couldn't understand what's going on and what's happening here. But thank God that it does not end in Mark chapter 15, but we are able to flip over to Mark chapter 16. And so we pick up that story today. I'm going to ask Levi Allen to come and read this morning. Uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. And then as you have your Bible in Matthew 28, I'm going to ask you to flip through these two uh, different passages. So Mark 16, 1 through 8. Go ahead, Levi. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will ro- roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See this place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. All right. Thank you, Levi. So, here in Mark chapter 16, we we have... Uh, this tremendous event here. It begins in verse 1, when the Sabbath was over. Now, one thing you need to know in Jewish history, the Sabbath was on Saturday, right? And Saturday was a day that you couldn't go to the store, you couldn't buy anything. And, and so Saturday hits and the women can't do anything. But in the Jewish mindset, the day then begins at sunset and ends at sunset. So Saturday at sunset, The Sabbath is over, and they very likely went and bought spices, but it's dark, right? So they're not going to go to the tomb. And so the Sabbath is over, and it says here, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Now Mark mentions three women here, and that's where the story of the resurrection begins. Now, There are other accounts of other appearances of Jesus. And in fact, Paul mentions these in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll put these on the screen because I want you to see what Paul says here. Paul says, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And and, and Paul begins to talk about all these appearances. He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Now, if you're reading that, what do you notice is missing? Which resurrection appearance is not there? This one, right? Paul doesn't mention The women go into the tomb. Why does Paul not mention that? And and you have to understand, when Paul is writing this letter to the church at Corinth, He's kind of proving that Jesus has risen from the dead. And in the first century, women 
were not reliable sources. At least they didn't see women as reliable sources. In, in many places, women were considered low on the totem pole in the first century. That's just the world in which they lived. It wasn't that Paul was against women. Paul was just making the case, and he thought, well, the women's testimony is not going to hold up there. You see, women could not bear witness in court. In, in some places in the first century, women were seen as property. But isn't it interesting that God chose women to be the ones to whom Jesus would first appear. I think there's something in that. I think God wants us to see something in that. Think about it. When Jesus was born, what was his bed? It was a manger, right? It was a place where horses fed. Who were Jesus' first visitors when he was a baby? Shepherds. These stinky men that nobody liked, that everybody thought was the very bottom of the social order. Those were the ones to whom God chose. And so I think there's something in this, and we're going to get to this as we kind of close up this morning toward the end of the sermon. We're going to talk about the fact that there are women. But I wanted to point out to you very early on that these women, they're the first ones, and God chooses them to be the first ones. And they're going to a tomb, and we read here in Mark chapter 16, verse 2, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And again, we talked about they probably bought the spices maybe Saturday evening, but they've got to wait till the sun comes up. They're going to anoint the body. That's what women did in this day. They would go to anoint the dead with spices. And so that's what they're doing. And then flip over to Matthew chapter 28. I want you to hold your finger in Mark 16 and Matthew 28. And I want you to look at these two accounts. We're going to read both of them this morning. You'll notice some differences in the accounts. Now, that's not a problem. And you might say, well, why, why does Matthew say one thing and Mark say something else? Well, if we had a, a, an event that we recorded today and I asked you to write a journal entry about it and I asked someone else to write a journal entry about it, it'd probably look a little different, wouldn't it? And some of the details might be a little bit different. You see, these gospel writers are just writing from their experience and this is what they're writing. Matthew tells us, after the Sabbath, on the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Now, you might notice Mark mentioned three women. Matthew mentions two women here. Mark tells us that Salome was also with them. Mark also says that they were worried about how they would get to the tomb. Mark 16 verse 3 says, They asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Now, Matthew gives us a little bit more information. Matthew tells us in Matthew 28 too, There was a violent earthquake... For the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to a tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Now you've got to think, these women are going to a tomb. Did they not think about how they were going to get in, right? <laughs> it's a big stone over the, the doorway. And they're worried about this a little bit. They're wondering how, what's going to happen. How are we going to get in? Maybe somebody can open it up for us. But Matthew tells us that there was an earthquake. And this earthquake shook the ground. An angel appears and the stone is rolled away. Now, the earthquake you might notice was there at Jesus' death. Remember when Jesus died on the cross? There was an earthquake, and now there's an earthquake at his resurrection. Now, back to Matthew 28, verse 2. There was a violent earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. And then Matthew describes what the angel looks like. He says, his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. Now, do you remember a few weeks ago when we were talking about the transfiguration of Jesus? How was Jesus described? He was described white, like lightning, right? In other words, their appearance is something that's otherworldly. Their appearance is something that's not like, it's white, but it's whiter than anything that you've ever seen there. In other words, this angel is not from around here. He has all the characteristics of being from heaven, of being uh, from another world. He's white like lightning, it freaks the women out. I mean, as you might imagine, look at verse 4. I'm sorry, it freaks the guards out. Verse 4. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Now, here's the irony here and almost the humor that you read here. Who's supposed to be dead now? Jesus, right? I mean, he's crucified. He's placed in a tomb. And the guards are guarding the dead man. But Matthew says that they are like dead men because they're so afraid of what has happened here. And then in verse 5 of Matthew 28, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. I know why you're here. You're looking for the body of the one who was crucified. He was dead, and dead people are supposed to be in tombs. And so you came to the tomb to anoint his body. 
Now, if we flip back over to Mark chapter 16, and again, comparing Matthew and Mark here, Mark doesn't mention the earthquake, nor does he mention the guards. But Mark says in verse 4, But when they looked up, they saw that the stone which was very large, had been rolled away. And then then Mark tells us that the angel's actually in the tomb in verse 5. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Now, back to Matthew 28, verse 6. He's not here. He has risen, the angel says. Come and see the place where he lay. Mark puts it this way in Mark 16, 6. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who is crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Now, he's supposed to be in the tomb, but he's not. And the angel tells him, now, his body's not been stolen. He has risen. Really three of the most powerful words in all of scripture, right? I mean, these three words form the basis of the entire Christian faith. And the angel reminds us that Jesus said he would rise. You remember Jesus told his disciples on another, on a number of occasions that he would rise. And and notice also that he says he is risen. He's already risen. Now, when I was a kid, I used to envision the tomb of Jesus, and and I've envisioned the stone rolling away and Jesus coming out of the the grave, right, and and this spectacular sort of thing. And and do you realize that the stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus could rise from the dead? The stone was rolled away so that the women could see that Jesus had been risen from the dead. In, In other words, Jesus had already risen, and the stone was rolled away so that people could see what was going on. Now, Now, let's think about this for a moment. You think about Easter and you think about Jesus and you think about Jesus risen from the dead. And and to most people in our world today, that's kind of an audacious claim, isn't it? To say that someone would be killed and then he would rise from the dead. But but let's think about that for a moment. What, What is death? Death, as the Bible recounts all the way back in the Garden of Eden, is a result of sin, right? We, we live in a fallen world. Jesus came into our fallen world. And our, because of our fallen world, because of sin, there is death. And we all die, right? We all sin and we all die. But what if, what if there was someone who never sinned? Would they still have to die? No, they wouldn't. But what if they chose to die you see their their death then would have the power to break the curse of death and that's what happened with jesus jesus sinless chose to take on death and die and ultimately to break the curse of death he submitted to death so that you and i could also break the curse of death death could not hold him the early christians sang hymns and many of their hymns are recorded for us in the Bible. One of their hymns is recorded for us in Philippians chapter 2 and Paul documented this hymn as he wrote this letter to the church at Philippi. Paul wrote this and I won't put this one on the screen I'll just let you hear this. This is how the early church understood Jesus. They said he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place. He gave him a name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's how the early church understood Jesus' death and resurrection. They understood it as breaking the power, the curse of death. The women are able to see what God has done. The the, the stone is rolled away. They're going in. They see his body gone, and an angel tells them he has risen. Death is defeated. He's risen just as he said. Come on in. Check it out for yourself. The angel then tells them in verse 7 of Matthew 28, Then go quickly and tell his disciples. So the angels tell the women, Go go quickly, tell the disciples, he's risen from the dead. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now, I've told you. Now, as you might imagine, the women are in shock. They're trying to take it all in. They can't quite 
put their, wrap their minds around what's going on here, all that they're seeing, all that they're hearing, all that they're experiencing. I mean, could you, right? An angel tells you that he's risen from the dead. Mark puts it this way in verse 7, but go tell his disciples, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. It's pretty cool, isn't it, to see how God chose the women to be the ones to go and tell. In fact, they were the ones who had stuck with Jesus through the whole crucifixion ordeal, right? And so in many ways, they were the ones who were even more faithful than the men, and God chooses them first. The disciples had abandoned Jesus, right? But the women stuck it out. And here, they are the first ones to attend to his body, and then God reveals to them that Jesus has risen. But God's not going to keep it a secret. The women are not going to be in this exclusive club. He's going to tell the disciples, and he tells the women, I want you to go and tell them that he's risen from the dead. He'll meet you in Galilee. And and that's exactly what Jesus had told his disciples before. If you flip back to Matthew 26, you can see Jesus said, but after I've risen, I'll go ahead of you into Galilee. And and so then the angel finishes the statement. He says, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I delivered the message. That's what an angel is, by the way. An angel is a messenger. And the angel says, okay, I delivered the message. I've done what I'm supposed to do. So verse, verse 8 of Matthew 28, the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. They're afraid yet they're filled with joy. Those two things seem to be in contradiction, right? They seem to contradict each other, but they're not. They're afraid on the one hand, but there's this sense of joy, And joy is more than just happiness. Joy is this deep inner sense that that everything is right. Mark puts it this way in Mark 16, 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Mark's a little bit more pessimistic here in how the women are responding. they They are freaked out, they're terrified, and they're not sure what's going to happen next. I mean, think about these women for a minute. In many ways, they've been traumatized, haven't they? They've watched Jesus, their friend, their rabbi, nailed to a cross. They're in this state of fear, and now they've been told that he's risen from the dead. Matthew tells us in verse 8, they hurried away from the tomb, again, afraid yet filled with joy. Now, again, that word joy is an interesting word. Matthew doesn't use it very often. In fact, he only uses it twice apart from the parables in all of his gospel. Once he uses it here at his resurrection. And the only other time the word joy is used is when the wise men show up at Jesus' um, birth. They're filled with joy, Matthew tells us. So they're freaked out, they're running, they're afraid. Uh, all of these things at the same time and yet filled with joy, you might imagine. But the story doesn't end there. Let's keep reading. Look at Matthew chapter Uh, 28 verse 9, and this is why I'm moving into Matthew here, because Mark kind of ends the story there in many ways, but Matthew continues to tell us what happens next. Verse 9, suddenly Jesus met them. I mean, it's one thing, isn't it, to see an empty tomb, and and they're freaked out, they're running away from the tomb, they're heading out to tell the disciples, uh, and Jesus meets them. One commentator says that most of the time when Jesus meets someone, Jesus, Jesus is, in the, is the object of the sentence. People meet Jesus, but here Jesus is the subject of the sentence. And there's something in that because they weren't looking for Jesus. They weren't expecting to meet Jesus, but Jesus, again, the subject of the sentence, meets them. All of a sudden, there he was. No doubt, they're privileged, aren't they, to see Jesus all of their trauma, all their confusion about what's going on. And maybe they're thinking, I don't know if we should tell anybody or not. I, I'm, I don't know if they'll believe us. They'll think we're crazy, right? But Jesus shows up and meets with them. Verse, verse 9 says, greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Now, they fall down at his feet. And in ancient times, to clasp someone's feet or to grab someone's feet was a sign of submission, right? In many ways, they're saying, we are submitting to you. You are Lord. You might remember Luke describing the woman um, who anointed, the woman who anointed Jesus uh, before he died. 
in Luke chapter 7, verse 38, she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. And she wiped them from her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Flip that slide one more time there, Ian. Uh, that's the verse there in, in, in Luke 7. Same sort of deal here. They grab his feet. The other verb that Matthew uses here, they, they grab his feet and they worship him. This is a word that's often used to describe uh, people coming to Jesus. It was used when the wise men came to Jesus in Matthew 2, 2. The wise men said, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. And then the next slide there, Ian, 1433. Then those who were in the boat, the disciples, what do they do? They worshiped him. What does it mean to worship Jesus? It's really a confession, isn't it, that he is the Son of God. When the disciples in the boat worship him, it says that they confess that he is the Son of God. Jesus is who he said he is. He's risen from the dead. The women are seeing him. All they can do is fall at his feet and worship him. We really don't know how long this lasts, but Matthew tells us what happens next. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Now, what does Jesus call the disciples here? He calls them his brothers. That, that's interesting because they were the ones who had abandoned him, right? In many ways, they probably thought, you know what, we really failed. But Jesus calls them his brothers and he says, go ahead in the galley, I'll meet you there. Now, the women were afraid. They were probably afraid because they didn't know if anybody would believe them. They're probably afraid because they, they even, maybe even fear for their own life. But Jesus says, go into Galilee. And where are they? They're down in Jerusalem. Make the trip up into Galilee, and I'll meet you there, Jesus says. The disciples are going to see him too. What a story, right? As we gather here on Easter Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday, we read this story, and we think, well, what does that mean for us today? And I want to take just a moment before we close this morning just to, just to point out a few things in the story that I think are significant for us as we celebrate Easter. Something, some, th some of these things we might miss if, if we're not careful. Like I said, the, the first thing that we see in this scripture is that the first people that Jesus appears to are women. And again, if you understand the role of a woman in the first century, you would understand how radical this is, that Jesus would appear to women. He would appear to those that society saw as less important. You see, and this is kind of a, this is kind of a way in which God works over and over again, doesn't he? He comes to the least. He comes to the lowly. And maybe this morning you're in church and you're thinking, you know what, I, I really don't come to church that often. I feel a little weird being in church, a little strange being in church. And I don't know if God would even care about me and the message this morning of Easter is that Jesus cares about the least the lowly those who feel like they don't deserve him those who feel like society kind of beats them up God comes to the least the lowly that, that's a message that we see throughout scripture and I think the women going to the tomb the women being the first ones to see Jesus that that's important in the message of Jesus Sec secondly we learn here that as we see the risen Christ, as we understand the risen Christ, what do we do? You know, too often we see being a Christian as a list of rules or, or religion. We've got to follow all this. We've got to do all this. We have to attend these services. We have to do all these, these ritualistic sort of things. And then maybe we'll be right with God. Not at all. One of the things about Easter and about the women here is that in all their fear, they simply worship Jesus. And I, I think that's really what God wants from us. As we come uh, to worship this morning, if we can just fall at the feet of Jesus and worship him, that's all he requires of us. Fall at his feet. Worship him. Confess that he is God. Believe that he is risen from the dead. And, and lastly, this morning, as we read this story, we realize that this really is the center of our faith. I was at the gym this week. And uh, someone was working out beside me, and they, they knew that I was a pastor. And they said, hey, are you ready for Easter? I said, yeah, I'm ready for Easter. They said, do you ever get kind of a letdown after Easter? Easter's like the high point, right? That's, like, that's the big Sunday. And do you, after Easter, do things just kind of go downhill from there? <laughs> and I responded to her, and I said, 
No, not really. Easter is what we celebrate every Sunday, really, isn't it? And today is a special Sunday. Today is the Sunday in which the world looks to Christians because of Easter. But Easter is something that we celebrate every Sunday. Every Sunday we celebrate the risen Christ because it is the center of our faith. If Christ were not risen from the dead, all that we do would be in vain. But because Jesus is risen from the dead, we have life. You see, there's no other religion, there's no other philosophy like Christianity, is there? Jesus, dying for our sins, God himself coming into our fallen world and dying for us so that our sins could be forgiven, raising to life so that we can join him in that life. That's what our faith is really all about. So as we come together on this Easter Sunday, on this Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate the risen Christ. And, and as the band comes now, we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to sing a song. And maybe this morning you'd like to take a moment to respond uh, to that song, uh, to respond to the message. Uh, we're going to sing uh, the song, Christ is Risen. And as we sing this, maybe you'd like to come and kneel at the altar and pray. Maybe you'd like to come and pray with me. I'll be standing down front this morning. Maybe there's some other decision you'd like to make uh, during this time of response. You're invited to do that now as we stand and sing. Mm -hmm. 